Now I'm going to turn on 2,000 volts. What? 이 장면은 실험실에서 눈송이를 만드는 첫 번째 단계입니다. This is totally wild. What? It's crazy, huh? The tips of those needles are like 100 nanometers in diameter. That is so wild. 캔디 버트 박사는 눈송이 박사입니다. I was the snowflake consultant for the movie Frozen. It's okay to conjure snowflakes out of your fingertips, but they have to be real snowflakes or people aren't buying it. <laughs> <laughs> the U.S. Post Office made snowflake stamps using my pictures. It's not the kind of thing you normally think of when you start doing physics that you'd be on a postage stamp. You've written the book on snowflakes, literally. So I had like two successful books in a row. So we just kept making books until finally they sold zero copies, <laughs> and then we stopped. <laughs> so you're kind of like a snowflake artist. I call it designer snowflake. Because yes, I am designing this on the fly. I don't have a computer that does all this for me, I just do it by hand, so everyone's a little different. So what's happening now is it's growing and doing its thing. It's, um, it's at minus 13 Celsius now, but I want to make some branches. I'll just turn this down to minus 15. And then I'm going to increase the humidity a little bit, the supersaturation, and you'll start to see branches come out there. See, so you changing those conditions just caused the plate to kind of stop and become really... I changed the growth conditions to prefer branches. This little thing right there, that little nub, that's the only thing that touches the sapphire substrate. The rest of this is all growing above. This increases the airflow. Those are droplets forming and now I'm really kicking it in gear. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn that humidity down to zero so the droplets are starting to recede. And this will stop growing and kind of start to facet a little bit. Say, I want branches again. Now I'm going to really hammer on it. So you're giving it a lot of moisture. A lot of moisture now. But you'll see side branches. You really start to feel you understand what's going on when you can say, now I'm going to do this. And then it happens. It's fun. I can predict the future. <laughs> I, I like to think they're better than nature. Uh, and the reason is that the, the facets are just sharp. All the edges on these things are just sharp and crisp. Whereas in the sky, they, they have to fall. And by the time they fall and you pick them up and you put them under a microscope, they've started to evaporate a little. Boy, these are just bang, just, just crisp. 지금 보시는 이 사진은 1885년 미국 기상학자 윌리슨 벤틀리가 눈송이를 접사 촬영한 최초의 사진입니다. 모든 눈송이가 다 조금씩 다르게 생겼다라고 주장한 벤틀리는 일생 동안 5천 장 이상의 눈송이 사진을 찍었고 그중 일부는 그의 책 스노우 크리스탈에 실렸으며 지금까지도 발간되고 있습니다. 그러나 대부분 눈송이는 벤틀리가 사진으로 찍은 것처럼 생기진 않았습니다. 왜냐하면 그는 이쁘고 대칭을 지닌 깨끗한 상태의 눈송이만을 선택했기 때문이죠. I mean, when you're looking for snowflakes, I'll take a big piece of cardboard. And you just glance at it. Crap, nothing. Brush them aside, more. No. Each brush is a thousand snowflakes. They're hard to find. You can't, you know, they're one in a million. I mean, literally. 우리는 모두 이런 눈송이 사진을 너무 자주 봐서 눈송이의 신비에 대해 쉽게 생각하지 못합니다. 예를 들어 왜 모두 여섯 개의 방사 대칭을 가지고 있을까요? 그리고 어떻게 이렇게 복잡하면서도 서로 다르죠? 그리고 어떻게 완벽하게 대칭을 이룰 수 있을까요? 제 말은 눈송이가 커질 때 반대편이 어떻게 자라는지 어떻게 결정되는 거죠? 그리고 왜 눈송이는 평평할까요? 일반적으로 지름이 밀리미터이지만 두께는 마이크로미터까지 작습니다. 이처럼 신비한 눈송이는 이 모양처럼 생각하기 쉽지만 사실은 모든 종류의 다른 형태를 취합니다. 이와 같이요. 속이 빈 기둥입니다. That is a snowflake. That is a snowflake. 바늘 모양. 
컵 모양 그리고 총알 모양도 있습니다. This is like my favorite kind of snowflake is a cap column. It started out growing as a column, but then the temperature changed and then you got plates growing on either end. 단순한 눈송이가 어떻게 그렇게 많고 다양한 형태를 만들어낼 수 있을까요? 모든 눈송이는 같은 방식으로 형성됩니다. 물이 수증기로 증발되고 증발된 수증기는 대기 중에서 상승하고 냉각되고 과포화 상태가 됩니다. 즉 어떤 온도에서 평형 상태에 있는 것보다 공기 중에 더 많은 물 분자가 생기게 되는 거죠. 물 분자는 먼지 입자에 응축되어 작은 방울을 형성하게 됩니다. 그리고 온도가 영하 이하가 되면 어느 시점에서 물방울이 얼게 될 것입니다. 내부에서는 물 분자는 제자리에 고정되어서 육각형 결정을 형성합니다. 이 구조는 물 분자의 특성에서 비롯되는 것인데요. 산소 원자는 수소보다 전자를 더 많이 가지고 있고 물 분자는 꺾인 모양을 가지고 있기 때문에 산소는 음전화 그리고 수소는 양전화를 띱니다 이때 여러 물 분자들이 모이면 서로 음전화와 양전화들끼리 끌어당기며 수소 결합이 이루어지고 육각형 결정을 형성하게 되는 것이죠. 그러나 이 원자 단위의 결합이 어떻게 우리가 볼수 있는 육각형 결정으로 자라나게 되는 것일까요? So you start with a chunk of ice, and these little guys are meant to be water molecules. And what happens is there are these flat surfaces, which are the facet surfaces, and at a molecular scale, they're very smooth and flat. And so when a molecule hits, a water vapor molecule hits that smooth and flat surface, it tends to bounce off. Whereas here, it's rough. There are a lot of dangling molecular bonds over here. That's a rough surface. And so when these molecules hit, they tend to stick. It's a statistical thing, of course, but the probabilities are high that they stick here and low that they stick here. So if you take any shape and you just let it grow for a little while, the rough areas fill in and the flat areas don't grow very fast and you end up with a faceted shape. 이게 바로 물 분자를 설명하는 원자 단위의 양자 역학에서 얼음의 육각형 모습으로 넘어갈 수 있는 방법입니다. 이 육각 기둥은 두 개의 밑면과 여섯 개의 옆면을 가지고 있습니다. 중요한 사실이죠. 옆면이 빠르게 성장하면 기둥 모양이 됩니다. 밑면이 더 빠르게 자라면 평평한 눈송이가 되겠죠. 일단 결정이 생기면 근처에 물방울이 침착되어 눈송이가 자라나게 됩니다. 육각형 프리즘의 모서리는 습한 공기에 더 많이 닿아있기 때문에 더 빨리 자라고 이제 더 많이 닿게 되고 점점 더 빨리 자라게 되겠죠. 이렇게 여섯 개의 방사 모양을 생성하게 됩니다. 이러한 눈가지의 모서리에는 똑같이 또 다른 가지가 만들어질 수도 있겠죠. 눈송이 하나를 만드는 데는 약 10만 개의 물방울이 필요하고 보통 30분에서 45분이 소요됩니다. 신기하죠? 1930년대 나카야 우키치로는 일본 후카이도 대학에서 체계적으로 눈송이를 연구하고 있었습니다. 그는 서로 다른 유형의 눈송이가 서로 다른 조건에서 발생한다는 것을 밝혔습니다. 온도와 과포화도 이두 가지 요소가 눈송이의 종류를 결정한다는 것이었죠. 그의 연구 결과는 이 나카야 다이아그램에 요약되어 있습니다. 단순한 패턴은 아닙니다. 마이너스 2도쯤에서 접시 모양의 눈송이가 생기고 마이너스 5도에서 기둥과 바늘 모양 마이너스 15도에서 다시 접시 모양이 되고 마이너스 20도 아래에서 기둥과 접시 모양이 나타납니다. 이 그래프를 통해 
눈송이의 대략적인 과거를 이해할 수 있죠. Does each snowflake in essence reveal its history through its shape? Yeah, absolutely. To some degree. You can definitely look at a snowflake and say, yeah, I know what conditions that crystal grew under more or less. The typical weather patterns, fronts, cold front. That produces a lot of capped columns because the cloud moves up, it starts to get colder and the initially start to freeze at around minus six, minus ten, that makes columns. And as it gets colder, then it the, makes branches and plates and so you get capped columns. 이는 눈송이가 왜 이렇게 복잡하게 생겼는지 설명해 줄수 있습니다. 성장하는 각 순간의 온도와 습도가 그 순간에 형성되는 구조를 결정하는 거죠. 지금 보시는 이 눈송이가 정확히 같은 조건에서 성장하기 때문에 대칭을 가지게 되는 것이죠. When the crystal changes its position, the temperature will change, say, and in all six branches we'll see the same temperature change, and so they'll all respond the same way. 모든 눈송이는 하늘에서 떨어지며 각각 조금씩 다른 조건을 가지고 있었기 때문에 두 눈송이는 똑같지 않습니다. 하지만 실험실에서는 그 조건을 주의 깊게 제어할 수 있으므로 이론적으로는 거의 똑같은 눈송이를 만드는 것이 가능해야 하며 실제로 캔도 그렇게 할수 있습니다. What's in here? Put your flashlight in and you'll see. Aha. Uh -huh. I'm imagining these are seed crystals of a sort. Those are little sparkly snow crystals. Yeah. You know, this is another little chamber, just a cold plate, and there's a little sapphire disc in there. And then I'm going to push this thing, my sapphire, all the way in here, and the crystals will waft onto it and hopefully stay there. The idea popped in. It's like, oh, if I grow two next to one another, they'll be kind of identical. And uh, I call them identical twin snowflakes because they're like identical twin people. They're not exactly the same, but clearly more alike than you would ever expect. <laughs> Is it really true that no two snowflakes are alike? I mean, yeah, it's just a silly question. <laughs> it's silly because no two trees are alike, no two grains of sand are alike, no two anything are alike. Anything that has any complexity is different from everything else because once you introduce complexity, then there's just an uncountable number of ways to make it. 만약 한 쌍의 눈송이가 너무 가깝게 자리 잡게 되면 둘 사이에 수분을 넣고 경쟁하게 돼요. 두 눈송이가 모두 성장을 방해받게 됩니다. The Nikaya diagram allows us to understand a lot about snowflake formation. Ken has used his experiments to build his own version of the chart. But what it doesn't explain is why do ice crystals form this way in the first place? I mean, why do we get plates and then columns and then plates and columns again? This has been a mystery essentially since Nikaya introduced his diagram back in the 1930s. But Ken believes he now has an answer. Anytime you have a crystal, the reason why you get these smooth, flat facets is because it's not easy to grow more crystal on top. There are so-called nucleation barriers. What you need is a critical density of additional molecules of the substance before they can come together to form a little island that is stable enough to grow and add another layer onto the crystal. When you're first forming a snowflake, you're always going to start with a hexagonal prism with its two basal facets and six prism facets around the side. And the nucleation barrier for the basal facets is different than that of the prism facets. If the nucleation barrier is lower for the prism facets, then they grow faster and you get plate-like structures. If the nucleation barrier is lower for the basal facets, then they grow faster and you end up with column-like structures. Now, the nucleation barriers of ice are known as a function of temperature, and this explains why around minus two, the prism facets grow faster and you get plates because their nucleation barrier is lower. You can also see why below minus 20 or so, well, then you get columns because the basal facet nucleation barrier is lower at those temperatures. But what doesn't make sense is why we should get columns at around minus five Celsius and then plates again at minus 15. So what is happening? Well, Ken's hypothesis is that these nucleation barriers are valid only for large flat facets, but if you had really narrow facets, well, the nucleation barriers would be different. 
So Ken proposes that narrow basal facets have a dip in their nucleation barrier around minus four Celsius, and narrow prism facets have a dip at minus 15. So his hypothesis is that the graph should look like this. This then is consistent with all the different forms of snowflakes that grow at different temperatures. But what accounts for these dips? 얇은 눈송이를 생각해 보죠. 접시 모양의 눈송이를 키우고 있습니다. 밑면에 부딪히는 물 분자는 핵 생성 장벽을 극복하는 데 필요한 임계 밀도에 도달하지 않아 표면이 천천히 성장하게 됩니다. 하지만 옆면에서는 물 분자가 거친 가장자리에 달라붙을 수 있겠죠. 또한 표면 에너지를 최소화하기 위한 이 면의 이상적인 모양은 반원형이 될 것이며 따라서 물 분자를 최소한으로 이동하여 표면 에너지를 낮추려고 하면 많은 분자가 옆면으로 확산되고 이 과정에서 핵 생성 장벽을 극복하는 데 필요한 임계 밀도를 초과하여 성장할 수 있게 되는 것입니다. So due to this narrow edge, the nucleation barrier is effectively lower than it would be for a large prism facet. A similar effect happens for the basal facets, just at a different temperature. And Ken has done experiments to investigate whether these effects are observed in the lab. And so I did a series of experiments using that apparatus. And man, it just like, boom, just like that. <laughs> Whoa. When you make a model and you sort of find it's supposed to do something, and it sort of does, it's just like, this might be right. So far, the results agree nicely with the hypothesis. So after 85 years, maybe we now understand the molecular physics of ice well enough to finally explain why snowflakes grow into such a diverse collection of columnar and plate-like forms. And I used to, I've done a lot of my career in astronomy and astrophysics. Nobody ever asked you what it's good for. I mean, never, not even once did anyone say, you know, what are those black holes are going to be used for? No. <laughs> Saturn's rings. Why do you care about Saturn's rings? What, what's the motivation for studying Saturn? No, nobody asks that. Every time I give a talk, people are like, what are you doing? What, what, what on earth is this for? I tell you the real reason, the real reason that I got into this. You look at a snowflake and you kind of go, um, actually, <laughs> we don't have any idea how that works. Well, that's just not, that doesn't work. We have to know how that works. Damn it. Well, I want to be the guy who figures out how snowflakes work. That's always been a driver, you know. As a scientist, you want to figure something out. <laughs>